Independence Day 1976. A day of celebration for hundreds of millions of American citizens. But for those paying attention to the radios, it was equally a day of concern. On dozens of radio stations, those operating on the 3 to 30 megahertz range, an unusual clicking sound emerged out of the blue, disrupting both civilian and military channels. For the next 13 years, this sound would plague radio broadcasts, and then it would disappear. This is, of course, the interference of the Duga radar arrays. One of these arrays happens to be just a few kilometers from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and sits abandoned today. Let's trace the story of this gigantic structure to the present day, and see what future awaits it. The story of the Duga project begins in the 1960s, with a man by the name of Efim Shchirim, with proposals for detecting aircraft and launchers of ballistic missiles at a distance of 3,000 and 6,000 kilometers respectively, by using radio waves that reflected from the ionosphere down onto the targets. He was not the first Soviet to come up with this idea, but he was the one with connections, including the man who would become communication minister for the USSR. In 1961, they presented this project, labelled Duga, or ARC, to a commission. The commission was very clearly impressed, partly due to the urgency of an early warning system as a result of the arms race against the USA, and they approved this work for on-the-ground testing. A small-scale prototype of the Duga array was constructed, aimed not at the West but inside the Soviet Union, and these tests were indeed a success. In 1964, the Mikhailov receiver was able to successfully detect the launch of a rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and the team of course celebrated their success and began to work on a larger version of the project. The first true Duga array was built on the outskirts of the city of Mikhailov like the prototype, and consisted of two locations, the transmitter in the village of Luj, and the receiver on the outskirts of Kalnivka some 24 kilometers north-northwest. Now, the transmitter was the one that created the interference on radio communications, as it sent a powerful signal up into the sky where it reflects on the Earth's ionosphere onto targets, which are then reflected back and detected by the receivers, which have to be both massive and of high power to detect what will now be, obviously, quite the weak signal. Of these two stations, virtually nothing remains, except for two high-frequency antennas reportedly part of the transmitting station, and historical photographs, of course. But this array wasn't even completed and fully tested in 1969 when the Soviet government decided to expand their system into the final form. Two more arrays, much larger than the one in Mikhailov, were planned. One in Komsomolsk on Amur, a metallurgy site that developed military equipment, including submarines and aircraft, and the other close to the town of Chernobyl, where the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was just entering construction. Now we have finally arrived at Chernobyl 2 and the Duga radar array there. This site wasn't even meant to be in Chernobyl. It was originally meant to be near the small town of Dima, but was pushed north into the swamp plant of Chernobyl where it could occupy unfertile ground in the breadbasket of Europe. Equally, this site wasn't even the source of the Russian woodpecker sound. What few people know is that the Chernobyl Duga array was only the receiver of the Duga system. The transmitter was located roughly 57 kilometers away, in Lyubek. After the Chernobyl disaster, the town of Slavutich, which was built to house the power plant workers displaced from Pripyat, was rather close to the transmitter, and it could be seen from the tower blocks before dismantling. Wikipedia also seems to mix up the transmitter and receiver stations here, for some reason. The transmitter was very powerful, consuming 8 megawatts per hour, enough to power 16,000 21st century homes for the same time. 
The sheer energy released in the transmitter was so powerful that the employees at the transmitter station felt the effects of the signal in their hands. The receiver end of the woodpecker was located, of course, in the town of Chernobyl too. The 820 meter long, 150 meter tall, red and white radar station was composed of 30 distinct antennae, with specialised receivers comparable in size to houses. This town was completely hidden from the public, with maps labelling the site as a pioneer camp for children. Because the place did not exist, students who graduated from the town were recorded as the students of Pripyat, and access to the site by the general public was forbidden. Of course, Chernobyl too was not without its own amenities. Having its own hotel, hospital, cinema, football pitch, and even a hockey rink. In 1976, the transmitter in Lyubek went online, and the power of the woodpecker was unleashed. So powerful that not only did it begin to interrupt military communications from the likes of the UK, the USA and Canada, but it also disrupted air traffic communications. Not good, and they had to quickly adjust this. Because the radars only worked in one direction, they could not test the array using their own launchers like the prototype. So they instead tested Duga by detecting Tomahawk missiles launched from nuclear submarines by the Americans, and so began the quest to find the Russian woodpecker. Amidst the claims that the radio waves were mind control or ground and weather manipulation systems, anyone with experience in radio works quickly determined it was an early warning system and began to pinpoint its location. They quickly localised it to northern Ukraine between Chernobyl and Chernihiv, the location of both the transmitter and receiver. Perhaps the fact they could not identify the exact site led to this confusion, and NATO gave the site the designation Steelworks. Not Steel Yard, as is often assumed. Radio enthusiasts in the USA even decided to go to war with the radar array when NATO would not and whenever the array began to disrupt their frequency, the Russian Woodpecker Hunting Club, as they called themselves, would broadcast signals back that would cancel it out and jam the array, forcing them to change frequencies. A temporary solution, but it worked. But how effective was the Duga system for all the noise it made, actually? Not really effective at all, is the answer, a problem that the further testing they rushed through would have highlighted. The trouble with the system was that it relied on bouncing the signal off of the ionosphere back down onto the ground. Unfortunately for the Soviets, they were bouncing their signal off the ionosphere around the poles, which is also where the solar winds interact with the ionosphere the strongest. So, their incredibly powerful and precise radar was being scrambled by interference from the sun of all things. It was calculated at one point that the over-the-horizon radar could only detect single rocket launchers 10-20% to of the time, and just a 70% chance it would detect a mass rocket launch like the outbreak of a world war. A few kilometres southwest of the receiver was the Krog station, a circle of these receivers on the ground with a diameter of 300 metres. The purpose of this feature was to determine the direction of a target detected by the main array, and report everything to Moscow. This too did not work, but that was alright because it was instead repurposed into an ionosphere research station, and explored the high frequency ranges. Duga still had benefits of course. In July 1983, a faulty satellite wrongly reported that the Americans had launched a massive missile attack on the Soviet Union. A counterattack could have occurred, thus starting a third world war, but the fact that the Duga arrays had not detected these signals, which they clearly should have given the size of the reported attack, prevented a shot. During 1985, the receiver at Chernobyl had an upgrade, and Duga did have a new breakthrough the following year successfully detecting the Challenger Space Shuttle launch in Florida. And then the explosion. A massive tragedy for the Americans, and the whole world. 
but for the Soviets who detected it, they received their rewards. And then, at 3 o'clock in the morning on an ordinary Saturday in April that year, when the commander of the site, Vladimir Muzimets, was alerted to the explosion at Unit 4 of the nearby nuclear power plant, the fate of Duga had been sealed. Muzimets and a chemical defence troop drove to Pripyat, measuring rising radiation levels on the way. For the next few hours, the Duga array continued as normal, until 11 in... At this point, the first radionuclei stream is currently blowing southwest, which meant it was now being sucked into the ventilation system for the receiver control room at Duga, which was obviously setting off a lot of alarms. But to turn off the ventilation and ensure the safety of the crew there, it would also mean overheating the computer systems that process the data from Duga meaning the entire station would break completely. At this time, the array was finally shut down. On April 27th, the residents of Chernobyl 2 were evacuated from the closed city, alongside their fellow citizens of Pripyat, leaving the soldiers stationed at the Duga array to their new duty. The soldiers had been visited by the government commission on the 26th, and some conscripted all ready to begin filling the sandbags used to bomb the reactor making the guards of the Russian woodpecker among the first liquidators of the Chernobyl disaster. This continued through the following weeks, filling the bags as the fresh materials arrived at Yanov station, and then released from duty when they reached their maximum radiation dose. And all of this time, Duga lay abandoned and disused. The first attempts to decontaminate it were made in June of 1986, by a chemical defence brigade from Leningrad. It took them three days to decontaminate the site, spraying down surfaces and digging up the ground surrounding it, but this was only effective for a short period of time. When the radiation levels returned, a basement was repurposed into a barracks where people could eat and sleep in safe levels of radiation. Of course, all of these attempts to save the site and decontaminate the land never amounted to much. In 1987, the site was officially closed, and looters and military alike wreaked havoc on the site, stealing plenty of electronic equipment, which also ensured it could never be used again. At some point before 2005, the transmitter in Lübeck was also dismantled and sold for scrap. Only a few buildings from the site remain today. They can be seen on recent satellite imagery, but will remain derelict and gutted. As for the iconic receiver, the decades of lack of maintenance and combined with the bitter winters of the region rapidly deteriorated its structure. And it was eventually scheduled for demolition, kept away from Taurus simply for the risk of collapse. The saviour of the array was Sergei Mernyi, who happened to be the co-founder of Chernobyl Tor. He became in charge of the maintenance of the array saving it, and soon it was added to the regular tour schedule. The future looks bright for the array, should maintenance work be able to resume. There have been cases of people scaling and even base jumping from the site, but do not attempt this because it is still very unstable, and there's no way to tether yourself to this 150 meter tall monster. There's even plenty of modern conspiracy theories related to this radar, such as how it is associated with the 1986 disaster. This is pretty clearly false given the actual scientific background, but I may cover this in more detail in the future. But what happened to the other large Duga radar, the one in Komsomolsk on Amur? Well, this one operated into the late 1980s, at which point it seemed obvious that the efficiency of these such radars were not exactly the best for detecting incoming missiles. Especially compared to technology the West was using, like the phased array radars used in the ballistic missile early warning system at the time. It had become mothballed by 1989. Then, in the early 1990s, a fire ripped through the site and put an end to the Komsomolsk on Amur station. It, too, has been dismantled. The Duga Array is one of the most iconic landmarks in all of Chernobyl. The uniqueness of its design its contrast with the forest around it, and the eternal secrecy of the project, all combined to create one of the most incredible places in the exclusion zone, 
displayed in countless shows and documentaries, and even video games. But it is, like the nuclear power plant, also a symbol of rushing research for failed results, ending with the loss of the site. The legend of the Russian woodpecker too, will always continue to captivate the planet, being one of the earliest terrifying events of the radio age, and influencing many stories, such as that of mind control. It is truly an object worth appreciating.